Hello, and welcome to the Canadian Health Information Podcast. We call it the CHIP for short. I'm Avis Favreau, and I'm hosting this conversation for the Canadian Institute for Health Information, known as CAIHI. Our goal, an in-depth look at the Canadian health system, behind the data, and looking at problems and solutions. A note, the opinions expressed here don't necessarily reflect those of Kai Hai, but this is a free and open discussion. And this episode is about one of the most pressing issues in Canadian healthcare. There is a cross-country critical shortage of doctors and nurses, along with many other health professionals. Frontline teams are exhausted after almost three years of battling COVID and the effects of delayed care for everyone else. Nurses are quitting hospital work or moving to other areas of practice. They just can't take the long hours, forced overtime, abuse of patients, and some are speaking out. The physical exhaustion, like a lot of times, I can't even get up from the bed the next day. I work 28 shifts in a row, doing overtime, just trying to get us through. And a lot of our staff are doing that. When is this going to end? When is this going to stop? Dozens of emergency units and hospital wards across parts of the country have had to temporarily close because of lack of staff. And those that are open, there have been eye-popping waits. Joining us today are two people who are seeing the health crisis up close. People who have ideas, and may have some influence in shoring up what some call a health system on the edge of collapse. Dr. Doug Sinclair is a longtime emergency physician in Toronto and Halifax, a member of the Canadian Association of Emergency Physicians, and he's now Vice President of Medicine, Quality and Safety at the IWK in Halifax. Welcome, Doug. Thanks, Avis. Thanks for having me. And we're joined by Canada's newly named Chief Nursing Officer, Lee Chapman, a registered nurse and PhD in Toronto with a very big job to get nurses back onto the front lines. Welcome, Lee. Thank you very much for having me. So when you got the call that you were being tapped for this job, Canada's top nurse, the first one in over a decade, what was your reaction? I was very honored. I still am very honored, somewhat daunted by the, you know, task of representing over 400,000 nurses in this country. But I think, you know, overall, I'm very thrilled uh, for the position and really look forward to the opportunities to meet with nurses from across the country and, you know, certainly do my best in in terms of bringing their voice to the federal government uh, in decision making. Can you explain what your mandate is? My immediate priorities are very focused on health workforce issues, which is sort of not surprising. So looking at efficient integration of internationally educated nurses, looking at multi-jurisdictional registration. So having nurses registered in two or more provinces and territories. Right. And do you have any targets you have to hit? Part of the issue of targets is that we don't have a clear picture of sort of workforce data for nursing across the country. So that's perhaps a third priority is to look at uh, having unique identifiers for nurses nationally so that we aren't double counting and that we're able to actually make some projections in terms of supply and demand with some accuracy. Before we move on to the bigger issue of HHR, I do want to say you have a very personal story behind your reason for moving into frontline nursing, especially in harm reduction and overdoses. And this has to do with something that happened to your brother. Do you want to share that? I um, sort of midway through my PhD, um, my older brother, Brad, died of an overdose and had experienced homelessness for most of his adult life and with cycles of sort of incarceration. And it really sort of lit an equity fire, I guess, in me. And I really was troubled with, you know, how does this happen in a resource rich country like Canada that people fall through, not just cracks, but really gaping holes in the system. And so I think I got very involved in harm reduction work and homeless health care uh, specifically. And really at the core of that is, is around equity deserving groups and ensuring that our 
Canadian healthcare system meets the needs of all Canadians, um, not just those who are resourced and housed, but those who are also sleeping rough on our streets and sometimes also using drugs to survive like my brother. So, and that's always been, you know, that push for or advocacy for evidence-based healthcare that is really centered around the individual receiving care has been really something guiding my work in, in the last seven years for sure. And it must have been all the worse during the pandemic for nurses doing what you were doing. Yeah, I think there's certainly been a lot of trauma that nurses have experienced from, you know, witnessing the number of deaths that nurses have witnessed. Um, I think also, you know, nurses have been faced with unprecedented things that they've had to do in their in their work life. Uh, for example, you know, being the sole care provider for somebody in a in an intensive care unit and having family members say goodbye to their loved one via iPad. Uh, on FaceTime. And and that's really, you know, completely unprecedented. I think the critical staffing shortages that nurses have faced have been exceptionally difficult. Sometimes nurses are unable to leave at the end of their shift. You know, there's certainly a lot of collective trauma within the profession um, due to that frontline work. Along with the shortage of nurses, there's also a shortage of family doctors and emergency physicians. And that is no surprise to you, Dr. Sinclair. Is that right? Uh, That's correct, Davis. Uh, I was the chair of uh, what we call the Collaborative Working Group. We uh, produced a report back in 2016, seems like a long time ago. And we stated at the time, based on our research, that we had a, in 2016, had a deficit of uh, 478 full-time emergency physicians at that time. And we predicted that that number would go to 1,070 by 2020, two years ago, and uh, 1,500 in 2025, based on uh, who said they were probably going to retire and based on our residency training numbers. And after that report, we met with uh, all the post-grad deans in Canada, multiple governments uh, making this message, basically nothing happened. And of course, then the pandemic came along. So these numbers that we stated then that showed an extreme deficit of emergency physicians are only worsened by COVID. How frustrating is that? Well, it's very frustrating because, you know, so often, as Lee said, when we talk to government, they say we need data. So we provided data and here we are. And we know, you know, we know it's a lot worse. Uh, We don't, we don't have the data to say how much, but that's a big deficit, right? And we had practical solutions then for increasing training position for emergency physicians and reallocation uh, of positions. And those take time and uh, basically nothing happened. So here we are uh, now in a crisis that, as Lee has intimated, was totally predictable, even without COVID. And now people are scrambling uh, for solutions. And many of them will take some time to implement. Right. Actually, I should note that Kaihai is going to be coming out with updated health workforce data in a couple of months. So that will be the data, more data, and hopefully we'll get an even clearer picture. So just tell me what you're hearing from emergency physicians on the front line about what they're seeing, what they're facing. Well, emergency medicine is very much a team sport. And uh where it's really been hit is the frontline nurse, absolutely, as well as emerged physicians and and also our clerical and registration staff that work in emergency. And what we've learned, of course, our environmental service workers who are cr- absolutely critical to an emergency medicine operation. So the whole team has been hit extremely hard. And what's happened is, you know, people are leaving emergency departments and either they're looking for somewhere else or they're simply, you know, leaving the profession, which is which is very sad. I mean, I think a number of emergency physicians, nurses, I mean, they are in moral distress. I mean, as Leah said, trying to provide uh, remote care and when you can't have loved ones around, as well as the massive waiting times for emergency when you're trying when you know that people in the waiting room or on ambulances are suffering. This is really a cause of moral distress and has unfortunately caused many you know, many physicians and our nursing colleagues to leave the profession. I mean, I've been in this business for 40 years in practice, and I've seen many dips and many crises in the past, uh, you know, when there weren't any nursing jobs or when physicians left for the United States. And there's no question that this is much more extreme than we've seen before. Okay, well, let me let me open this up to both of you. First off, let's talk about the effect on patient care. 
Is this impacting how patients are being treated? Lee? I would say without a doubt, it's impacting uh, patient care. I think that we're actually seeing patients either not access necessary services uh, when they need to, which is resulting in certainly a delay, sometimes a delay in diagnosis or in treatment or in interventions, and certainly lengthy waits for care. The health workforce issues are certainly compromising our publicly funded system, uh, you know, our Canadian healthcare system as we know it. And Doug, where in the system are these shortages of these frontline teens felt the most? Well, you know, no question. Uh, our primary care system, which has struggled for many years, is really, um, you know, in, in significant trouble. Um, so, uh, you know, access to primary care is in such a desperate state that patients are, you know, having to go to emergency departments uh, for the only place that's open. You know, I think another big area is... Um, you know, we talk about uh, elective surgery. We need to get rid of that term. We need to call it scheduled surgery because the surgery that uh, patients are waiting for, like hip replacements, like cardiac surgery, and where I work for pediatric surgery, those are not elective. Uh, they are absolutely scheduled. There's a huge deficit in that work, of course, and there's no capacity for the healthcare system to really catch up. I mean, government said, okay, we'll put some money into working on weekends. Well, I'm working, you know, all night in the ORs. I mean, that simply is not going to work because of the limitation of our health workforce. And then what's that? That is causing then patients to come to emergency department, you know, late because their surgery has been delayed and delayed, and then they start to suffer complications. And we're seeing that absolutely on screening, right? For colonoscopy, our gastroenterologists have told us that there are patients with cancers that are, you know, being missed and they'll eventually kind of catch up to that. So that's a, you know, very significant uh, concerns. We're dealing with a fall season coming up. There's some suggestions there may be another wave of COVID. There certainly will be more flus and colds and other respiratory things. Um, let me start with you, Lee. Is there a fast level fix for this nursing shortage? I mean, healthcare is a complex issue, there's no doubt. So I, th I think there's no fast fix, unfortunately. But, but a short term one, given that we've got the fall, is there anything moving in place now for, for the fall season? So there certainly is work being done across the provinces and territories looking at health workforce and nursing issues specifically to try to integrate internationally educated nurses uh, much quicker uh, as, a, as a means of sort of increasing supply and looking at, you know, as I said, those who have left the profession, if we can recruit them back and certainly retaining those who, who are within the profession by making the workplace conditions better. What would that take? What would it take to keep nurses working? It really isn't a one-size-fits-all approach, but certainly what has worked in some jurisdictions has been you know, significant provincial focus or provincial territorial focus on health workforce issues, on nursing, recruitment and retention issues specifically. Um, Would that mean more money, better hours, better work-life balance? It can mean all of the above. And sometimes it's not necessarily about dollars. It's sometimes about the way resources are distributed. And sometimes uh, another thing that's been a real positive Thing has been in, in the way of regulatory reform. So, you know, nurses and most healthcare providers are uh, governed within the provinces and territories. So really trying to make things smoother or easier, easier for nurses. Mm -hmm. And then there's the abuse of patients component too. I mean, I heard from a number of nurses who were just being roasted or sometimes even violence directed towards them because people are so frustrated. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we, we've seen this sort of where nurses have been hailed as heroes during the pandemic, but they've also faced, you know, they've really been on the front line and faced abuse and discrimination. And so that's what I, I am referring to when I say looking at the workplace conditions. We need to ensure that providers who are working in these healthcare settings are absolutely protected and have a safe work environment, a safe and healthy work environment so that they're not uh, fearing abuse and discrimination or assault when they're actually going to deliver care. We noticed that during the pandemic, some nurses were offered bonuses. Does that work? You know, ultimately it comes to how they're 
life is respected, how they're able to balance their life uh, with work. And sometimes that means more flexibility than they currently have. And sometimes it, it may mean remuneration, but ultimately it is an issue of respect. Right. And so to you, Doug, do you see any solutions that are being enacted now that give you hope? Yeah, a colleague of mine said um, a lot of this is taking the pebbles out of people's shoes. So there's all kinds of things that in your work environment are irritating and frustrating. So try to smooth some of those to make, you know, the work day a better place, a a happier place, because it is a wonderful environment, certainly in emergency medicine. So what that means is a whole bunch of little things, right? So more flexible shifts, uh, more backup. You know, traditionally, we've always staffed to the kind of average, right? We need to overstaff for emergency physicians and certainly nursing so that we've got more redundancy in the system. That makes a huge difference to a shift if there's an extra pair of hands there. And that can be done, I mean, you know, fairly quickly. And to carry on what Lee was saying, I mean, the whole issue of respect of healthcare providers, this is really important. And we can move quickly on this because that is a change, right? In the past, especially nurses, also physicians, you know, whatever the patient said or however they spoke, that was kind of, we had to kind of accept that. And in fact, that's just not acceptable for anyone. I mean, everyone's getting grumpy and frustrated. So patients are frustrated, absolutely. In emergency department, they have long waits, but it's still no excuse for taking that abuse out on, uh, especially on triage nurses. On the internationally educated front, that's an interesting one. I think there's probably more potential and scope on the nursing side. On the physician side, you know, it's a bit limited. Many of the physicians that have been internationally educated, unfortunately, many of them haven't been practicing certainly in acute care for a long time. So it, it, it takes time to get them back to speed. A different for the Ukrainian. Ukrainian physicians are different, right? I was going to say that the Kai high data is showing that 9% of nurses are foreign trained and 26% of physicians are foreign trained. So it seems like there's more room to move on the foreign nurses. Is that right, Lee? Yeah, I mean, I think there, we know that there's a number of internationally educated nurses who are, are have facing long delays on the path to licensure and that sometimes things expire along the, the route towards settlement in Canada. So their language uh, requirements or their evidence of safe practice may expire. I think, you know, part of the issue with that figure, um, 9%, is that we know that there are many internationally educated nurses who are coming to, you know, a large country like Canada without sort of perhaps knowing where they're going to settle. So they might be registering in multiple jurisdictions. So we may be double counting them. And uh, I think that's why we we certainly need to look across the country into unique identifiers so that we do have a clear picture of how many IENs we have in this country and how many we need in terms of workforce planning. I know that um, in Ontario and Manitoba, I believe they're actually moving quickly to get the nurses doing part of their practicum that they would have had to done before or couldn't do during the pandemic right at the hospital level to move them in more quickly. Is that an example of a solution that could be looked at? Yeah, it's a great solution. It really is an exemplar because it does provide the practice readiness and it also provides language fluency and really does, it requires obviously close collaboration with the employer, but it is a way to to really effectively integrate internationally educated nurses into the workforce in a more streamlined fashion. So uh, Doug, one of the things we talked about in advance of the podcast was the importance of retention that while it's good to look to groups abroad, that there's more to be done. Like you said, the pebble in the, in the shoe. Is there something that we could do to keep doctors from retiring, tax incentives, anything like that, that would keep them in the field longer while we train more domestically, perhaps? Yeah, I really, certainly from a physician point of view, my colleagues might disagree, but I don't think this is a financial issue. I mean, this is very much a... a, a you know, a respect, a workplace issue. So I think there are many physicians who are either retired or on the verge of retirement. If you said, okay, part of it is hope, right? Here's the plan. If you can see what the plan is and you say, 
okay, I can step up and uh, commit to some part-time work for another year or so. I mean, that would make a huge difference. It was, if there was a sense of what the plan was and then, you know, support for, there's all kinds of wellness initiatives now that are, you know, in small areas. The Canadian Association of Emergency Physicians has some excellent wellness initiatives. So many of the societies have that work and it's again, government to kind of collaborate with them and push them out. You know, the portability of licensure is also important. I mean, unfortunately, we have, you know, depending on how you count, 11 or 12 jurisdictions, and each of them requires slightly different licensing in Canada, and the portability is a big problem. You can't move around. Now, provinces are a little low to do this because they see other provinces as poaching doctors, but, you know, we got to get beyond that. Uh, to Leah's point about the training capacity, that's also really important. I mean, I think if you said to hospitals, okay, Here's some internationally educated physicians. Can you take them on for a period, very defined period of a few months? You know, that's extra work, if you will, but you can kind of see the benefits. So I think there'd be appetite for that would require some leadership and work, but I think could go. Okay. Are there ways of improving things that don't involve more doctors and nurses or using what we have better? I think one of the... um, positive benefits of COVID, of course, has been virtual care. You know, uh, it was uh, virtual care was minimal, really, except in the North before COVID, and now it's taken off. Uh, Virtual care is a bit of the Wild West out there with uh, various companies jumping into this. So we have to be careful about virtual care, what actually needs an in-person visit, uh, and how does a virtual care visit connect into the larger system? You know, patients really, in general, appreciate virtual care. And one of the things we've learned is it provides access to uh, patients and families who normally wouldn't have access uh, to care in in rural areas um, and some of our disadvantaged populations. So there's some real hope there for virtual care, but um, lots of work to be done in that regard on the kind of details of how it actually works. And what about the backlog of surgeries, diagnostics, testing, Millions of people across the country are still waiting for tests. Is there is there an opportunity here? Oh, absolutely. There's a huge backlog, but I know you're going to do some future work on choosing wisely. There's lots of science that would suggest that, uh, frankly, many of the tests that we order are actually not necessarily. So rather than investing in getting all those tests done, let's really take a serious look on what actually needs to be done and alter the resources. So for example, we know we have backlogs in testing for colon screening, and we need to put resources into that. There's other uh, tests perhaps we've ordered in terms of imaging and other lab tests that, uh, you know, choosing wisely would suggest aren't necessary, and we can allocate resources in that regard, reallocate. I hope the opportunity is taken. So, Lee, do you have a timeline for goals, and what would success for you look like? Well, it is a two-year appointment, um, but I certainly do have some immediate, immediate priorities. I think, you know, my goals are certainly to bring that frontline perspective, that on-the-ground perspective uh, and nurses' voices to decision-making and at the federal level. That really is the ground-up perspective that I, I hope to bring to the minister and, and really to decision-making within the federal government because I think that better understanding those conditions will will help us with any initiatives that we're going to implement. And so I I certainly am a roll up your sleeves kind of nurse and and really hope to to use that in in this key role. Mm -hmm. And at the end of your two year term, what would be your wish? So I think really, you know, some stability in the workforce and pride in the profession would be overarching goals. The nurses have gotten very vocal during the pandemic. I'm sure you've seen uh, nurses taking to Twitter and much more open about doing interviews. This is a critical issue for nursing. Yeah. And I mean, I I have an advocacy background and I certainly would much prefer to see a very uh, engaged workforce uh, than than an apathetic workforce. So we do have that engagement. um, And I, I think we can absolutely work with that energy to make things better for the profession as a whole. To you, Doug, how would you measure success? Let's talk short term about getting through the winter with staffing shortages. I would see uh, certainly uh, some commitments to uh, increase coverage of emergency departments, decreasing uh, you know wait times with more innovative no- uh, models using uh, 
paramedics, nurse practitioners wisely, uh, and you know, see some. You know, we have the, we have the measurements. Let's see some uh, change in that regard. And uh, of course, a big plug for uh, vaccination in the fall with uh, the COVID booster coming out, with flu vaccinations coming, then with uh, you know, mask wearing, hands hand washing, all that stuff uh, that we learned through COVID. That's critically important that we continue into the fall. What would failure look like? I think failure would be, you know, increasing numbers of physicians leaving uh, and getting discouraged. And, you know, some of that is actually measured on some of the engagement surveys. So it's not just a feeling, it's actually measurement. So if we continue to see erosion of physicians leaving practice, that to me is very sad and would be a failure of the system. So it's incumbent upon us as leaders to make sure that we can, as I said, get the pebbles out of the shoes of of many of our providers, understand what's going on at the front line to uh, you know, make every day a better shift for them. So that will make a big difference. Thank you both for uh, joining. I almost wanna do this interview in a year from now and see how far we've gotten. I, as I said, the nurses are becoming more vocal. I've noticed physicians are more interested in talking about this. Um, this looks like a critical point uh, going forward. So thank you both for joining. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. The demands on Canada's health system will last long after COVID-19 eases as we deal with a huge backlog of procedures. And for that, we need a strong health force. Hi Hi will have new important data coming out on that later this fall. Thank you for joining our discussion today and please join us for our next podcast when we look into other important health topics that matter to you. Our executive producer is Jonathan Kuline. Special thanks to Isla Goyat and to Alian Yang, host of our French Kai Hi podcast. If you want to learn more about the Canadian Institute for Health Information, please go to kaihai.ca. That's C-I-H-I dot C-A, where you can get reliable data on important health measures across the country. And subscribe to The Chip wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Avis Favreau. Talk to you next time.